I marvel at the compassionate outreach we see constantly from leaders and members of other faiths and from people of goodwill everywhere who seek to reduce human suffering. When you see that level of devastation, you can't help but feel for the people and, and want to get involved. The scriptures say that you, you, you cannot, cannot be saved unless you care for the poor and the unfortunate. We really need what you guys are doing, and it's working. And I really appreciate it. What a great way to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and uh, sharing the gospel with others. We all live by the, when you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God, and that's the spirit that's throughout this whole thing. Serving God is not a thing of one or two days. That's a quest of all our lives. When the rising floodwaters come in our daily life, that uh, there is a way to be rescued from. Hello and welcome to the Bishop Central Storehouse in Salt Lake City. From wildfires to earthquakes to hurricanes, 2017 was a year full of unrelenting natural disasters. But even as those calamities were taking place, Utahns were ready and willing to provide assistance, offering aid amidst the storm. We've heard so many inspiring stories of people willing to look outside of themselves to make a difference. Friends, neighbors, and members of congregations banding together to provide help in times of crisis. Today we share some of these stories as we visit the areas impacted by the disasters. We start in Puerto Rico. When I saw the winds coming through and people's tin roof were going up in the air like kites, you know, it really, it really shocked me. And then the very next day when everything was through, I saw the devastation. I said, well, this is this is bad. On September 20th, Hurricane Maria smashed into Puerto Rico with a vengeance, lashing the island with wind and rain for more than 30 hours. The Category 4 storm left the entire island without clean water and power. And all these months later, thousands of people are still without power. It's bad. This is going to take a couple of years for us to get back on our feet. The catastrophic destruction from Hurricane Maria prompted a group of Utah friends to start a grassroots effort known as Light Up Puerto Rico. Each one has a personal connection to the island. Okay, buddy. My wife and I, we both served our LDS missions in Puerto Rico. We just felt helpless. We knew that people were suffering and there were people that we loved, but we just felt like, what can we do? And um, so we started to send around a few text messages to uh, some of our friends. Were you amazed at the response or was this something that you expected? I guess in some ways I was amazed, but I probably shouldn't have been because I know the people who, who got involved and this is kind of who they are. You know, we thought initially we'd raise maybe $10,000 to come out and hand out some lights, right? Um, and it's turned into so much more than that because of a lot of, a lot of giving hearts out there. Do you guys remember how much you raised? We raised like $500. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been raised, and they've partnered with other aid organizations to increase their impact. In late November, 40 Utah volunteers went to the island to help, each paying their own expenses to be part of the Light Up Puerto Rico team. Their plan was to bring hope and light, or luz, to the people suffering from the aftermath of the storm. La luz. I see. This is like tracting, man. November, okay. gracias a ustedes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Mucho Thank gusto. You. Except we, when we're tracting, we're giving them a different light. Buena como esta? But it's been 57, 58 days now that these people have not had had the electricity. We really appreciate what you mean. Me. 
So it feels good to be able to give them our light, metaphorically, I guess, and, and we hope they'll pass their light on to somebody else. And their gifts. Okay. Okay, yeah. I feel like we are his hands. I feel like we are the Savior's hands right now to help him to be able to help these people. I'm an emergency room nurse, so I can help you do yeah. other things. I have a sign that just says that we're praying for you, but they need so much more. You know, easy to, to live here. Yeah. Any place in Puerto Rico, you know, with the problem. And I've seen some bad things in war, but this, I can't compare it. Light Up Puerto Rico concentrated their efforts in areas where FEMA aid was slow to come. Supplies are coming just to the last place over there, but little supplies to this area because they believe that all the damage from Hurricane Maria was over there, but they forget about these people. If you take a look on my house, it get about four or five feet high of water. So let's just get some food, let's get hygiene, toilet paper, Whatever can fit in our box, everybody's going to be grateful for that. As they unloaded supplies, volunteers were touched by the thoughtful notes tucked inside the donations that poured in from generous Utahns. I hope you are all safe and okay. I hope there will be no more hurricanes. Thank you. You're welcome. The generosity of people back home enabled the group to help thousands. They walked door to door delivering solar lights and generators, gave away 100 pallets of food, bottled water and other supplies, and handed out water filtration systems. Teams of volunteers also spent time in outlying areas, putting up sturdy tents for dozens of families. And when they showed us the house with all the mold, it was, it was just like, it just hit me so hard. It's just so sad. We walked in inside. There was water on the floor. <laughs> there was all, walls were black. The roof was falling apart. Que esto ha sido bien difícil para nosotros. When we came out, I told the lady, so what are you feeling? And she, basically said this is an answer to a prayer. That answer came in the form of a dry, safe, comfortable tent shelter for her and her family. It was the one-on-one -on -one contact that left the greatest impression. I want to meet people. I want to talk to them. I want to know their story. With that, I hope I'm giving the light and water to the people who are the most needy and the people who are the most willing to share it. It's been pretty amazing for all of us just to pitch in and contribute to the work. It's been amazing. So we went into her house, pitch dark, and she said, I, and I brought this light in, and we, and we turned the light on, and she just started sobbing. She started crying. She says, you don't know how, how, how happy this makes me. I am so scared of the dark. You think about the impact that just a light can bring into someone's life, um, it brings a whole new level of, of desire to help. I see one mace, one month. I said, what do you need? Are you okay? How old is your baby? And it was just a little four-week-old baby. And she let me hold the baby. She was just so sweet and tiny. And I said, what do you need? And she said, just water. Maria. Maria, ooh. Connecting with people who are, who are suffering the way they're suffering. It's hard for anybody. Um, it's challenging for me to see it with people I love so much. And to be able to come was, you know, to see the people that I grew to love 33 years ago and be able to come back in some way and, and serve again was, was just something I had to do. Be careful, watch your step. That's what it's been, it's just love and compassion. I don't think I've fully understood that until I've been involved with Light at Puerto Rico. It's, it's loose. It's como un, un uh, flashlight. It takes each of us picking up and helping, uh, you know, neighbor to neighbor, a uh, friend to friend, and Utah to, to Puerto Rico. Javier, no se preocupe, ¿cómo está? Bien. I mean, I'm the Lieutenant Governor, but I'm just here as me. Um, I, I'm, I feel very blessed uh, that, that I speak Spanish and that I get a chance to come down here and, and share some of the goodness of Utah with people. Ahora mismo, señora, claro que sí. We were serving, we were not representing the church, you were not representing an organization. Amigo, cuídese mucho. Chévere. We were just citizens that at some time in our lives, we made a very sacred decision to go and serve God. Entonces ellos tienen un gran amor por esta isla. Y el Señor nos ha mandado para poderle cuidar a usted y a su familia. 
serving God is not a thing of one or two days. That's a quest of all our lives. What we're doing here uh, seems like a drop, drop in the ocean, but when, when you see, when you give a person a, a simple light that hasn't had light in their house for two months, um, you, you know that it's all worth it. Puerto Rico se levanta! You see everywhere we travel or we go on the roads, uh, lots of signs saying Puerto Rico se levanta, which means Puerto Rico will rise up. So that's our hope. And they are working and they have that in mind all the time. Be it helping a neighbor, be it going across an ocean to help a little island or whatever it might be, if we'll live with the motto of, if not you, who? And if not now, when? The world will become a better place. Before hitting Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria also wreaked havoc on the small island country of Dominica. Up next, an important lesson one Utah man learned while delivering life-saving supplies to the island. Even in places where there was no TV coverage of the disaster, Latter-day Saints felt moved to individually help those in need. Before Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico, it hit the small, little-known island country of Dominica as a Category 5, with sustained winds of 160 miles per hour, leaving what many described as mind-boggling devastation. And on a fall afternoon in October, thousands of miles away in Heber City, Utah. We've only got 50 more to go. Box after box of protein bars were loaded onto a cargo plane. More than 9,000 individual bars to provide nutrition to those in need. High density, high calorie, high protein, shelf stable stuff that you know is going to last in that climate. Good nutrition, protein bars, and for people that you know are star literally starving, this is uh, going to be a godsend to them. The power-packed food donated by a Utah company. A battery switch on. Would be flown by Barry Hancock, who volunteered his plane and skills for two weeks to fly relief missions around the island. The airplane was the right plane for the mission, um, and it was the, really the only way to get supplies there quickly was through kind of these medium-sized uh, airplanes that could carry a lot of payload. 300 feet, right on target. 110 gears down. The planes created an air bridge between Barbados and Dominica, transporting food, medical supplies, and rescue workers 175 miles over the ocean landing on very short and primitive airstrips on the small island nation. Kind of the staples that you would think of, salt, sugar, uh, canned meats, all the way up to, you know, diapers and toilet paper. And it's a, you, you don't realize all the basic necessities of, of you know, of life in, in this day that you need. And we hauled all kinds of different stuff that those people needed for two weeks. And as Hancock found himself more than 3,000 miles from home, he worked side by side with others who he now considers family. Whether you're a member of our church or not, people have the desire to help when they see people in need. And it was so gratifying to see all these people come together from all these different walks of life, all kinds of different religions and different backgrounds and different beliefs, and come together to help people in need. It was um, an experience that I'll never forget. Uh, and it taught me a lot about the goodness of humanity. All right. Uh, After two weeks, Hancock says he received more than he gave, coming home with a better ability to see the many possibilities to serve those around him. You can spend more time attending to the needs of your, you know, your family or your friends or the people in your neighborhood and your community. Um, and, and we all have the ability to do that. And frankly, I feel a greater obligation now to look around me and my circumstances and say, what can I do to help someone today?
During September, earthquakes in Mexico were also in the news. Still ahead, the LDS Church sends leaders to assess the needs in areas hardest hit by these devastating earthquakes. The images are hard to comprehend. On September 7, 2017, an 8.2 earthquake shook the states of Oaxaca and Chiapas in southern Mexico. Two weeks later, a 7.1 near Mexico City. Sister Reina Alberto, second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency of the LDS Church, visited one of the more devastated areas of Oaxaca. The experience brought her back to the time she was in an earthquake as a child in Nicaragua. I remember that I was there for a few hours and then when they finally took, um, were able to get me out of the, of the rubble. She says like many of these survivors, she too was brought to a dark place. I remember the feeling of destruction and desolation and hopelessness that, I, uh, that was all around me. So when I came to this place today, I went back to that time. But unlike her experience, days after the destruction, herds of volunteers with LDS charities provided medical care for those injured, strengthening them physically and spiritually. Al ver a los hermanos, a las autoridades actuar, venir, estar con nosotros, darnos esa fortaleza espiritual. Volunteers armed with yellow helping hands vest assisted in recovery efforts, spreading messages of hope. Porque sé que a pesar de la destrucción que el terremoto ha ocasionado en nuestras viviendas, tenemos una gran certeza que el Padre está consciente. While there, members of the local LDS congregation gathered to sing praises. Now, three and a half months later, Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles visited the neighboring area of Jojulta to see how the community there is rebuilding. Our heart just feels so moved by the many difficulties that people in this community have had, not just the members of the church, but all the people who, because of uh, something they could not control, nothing they could help, that suddenly their houses fell down and they were without the few things they had in life. Locals say slowly but surely, recovery efforts are pressing on. Pues levantando esta casa con fondos parte del del gobierno y pues parte de nosotros de mano de obra. También tenemos que poner nuestra nuestra cooperación en cuanto a la ayuda con mano de obra y y pues adelante vamos a salir todos. Alberto says it's in this time where many find strength to serve others. Instead of us looking at ourselves as victims, we can see ourselves as survivors, that we have survived and that we can go and help others. And the unity that comes from this is also something that we need to keep with ourselves forever. Another area hard hit by disaster was Texas. Hurricane Harvey was the second most costly storm to hit the U.S. mainland. Up next, generous Utahns joined KSL to raise money for the recovery effort. The fiercest storm to hit Texas in more than 50 years. But as Hurricane Harvey's path focused directly on Houston, it wasn't the powerful winds from the storm, but the unrelenting rain for days, a record-setting 52 inches, 
that flooded thousands and thousands of homes. And the images of people fleeing the floodwaters in boats, leaving everything behind, touched hearts around the nation as the magnitude of this disaster began to hit home. As you know, we set up our Hope for Houston Telethon on Tuesday. And Utahns responded in a very generous way. An effort organized by KSL helped raise more than $1 million from the community for Harvey Relief, mostly through small donations that quickly added up. The supplies were delivered to Rockport, Texas, and received with tremendous gratitude. Everybody's been working so well and came together as one. Not only were the homes of thousands of people damaged, but floodwaters overtook the Houston Temple. Water seeped into the basement, causing damage that required the temple to be closed for repairs. Church members in the region immediately came to the aid of their neighbors. As the floodwaters began to recede, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf and presiding Bishop Gerald Kaze arrived on the Sunday morning following the disaster to give hope and reassurance to people devastated by the storm and encouragement to those serving as volunteers for Mormon Helping Hands. It really says helping hearts. It is helping hearts to reach out to others with our heart, with our mind, with our might, with our hands, with our feet, with everything we have. Hundreds of church members in yellow Mormon Helping Hands t-shirts came from surrounding areas and began serving strangers, clearing debris, removing damaged items, and salvaging what they could. Church leaders also came to oversee the long-term humanitarian effort here. It was very important for us to, to come here and to give our love to the members and recognize the hard work that they are doing combination of uh, the faith and people of no faith, people of faith, other faces, all joined together in a wonderful way. Seeing the devastation firsthand was emotional for these leaders as they ministered to those who lost everything, offering prayers and temporal support. Any favor this is a blessing to all of us. Very glad to have Mormon neighbors, you know, from the get-go. You know. And no one may have appreciated it more than Puya Hujazi, who lives near a Latter-day Saint family. His home was overcome by floodwaters. He was then flooded with help from Mormon Helping Hands. We were very happy, you know, to be in this neighborhood to begin with, but I never imagined the happiness would extend to emergency and disaster helps and stuff, you know, so they've been absolutely wonderful. We don't even ask, you know, they come, they ask, you know, they sometimes bring stuff and just give it to us. But this visit was about alleviating the suffering that so many Texans are experiencing. An emotional moment for President Uchtdorf to see so much goodness from these volunteers in the wake of such a disaster. When you see them working, they are wet, they are sweaty, they are hard working all day long, and the neighbors come up, and the neighbors have tears running down their, their cheeks, thanking these young people and these individuals for their dedicated service. I received more hugs here from the neighbors who are not members than from anyone else because they are grateful for what the church does here and what these young people do. For several weeks, Latter-day Saints would continue to don their yellow shirts to help their neighbors in need recover from the worst storm of their lives. Church members are now looking forward to the rededication of the Houston Temple following repairs from the floodwaters. The temple will be rededicated in a brief session by President M. Russell Ballard on Sunday, April 22nd, and will open to temple patrons later that week. In September, Hurricane Irma blasted Florida, leaving a path of destruction. Up next, thousands of Mormon Helping Hands volunteers descend on neighborhoods to help begin cleaning up the mess. On the heels of Hurricane Harvey, people on the other side of the Gulf began bracing for a massive storm. 
Unlike the devastating rainfall in Texas, it was the powerful winds of Hurricane Irma that sent fear across the state of Florida. God is everything. God is our strong. God is all our life. God protect to me and protect by your words. And we love to him. I know that we love to us. As Irma's wrath fell onto Florida, several families from the Bahia Spanish-speaking ward in Naples huddled together in the chapel, waiting out the storm in safety. It's hard for, for my people, for my members, but the support the hurricane with faith, with love to God. The eye of Irma passed over Naples, and the devastation from the storm was evident everywhere. Once again, Latter-day Saints began mobilizing to help. Gracias. Nice to see you. Where are you from originally? Uh, well, I was raised here in Naples. Your home? Yeah. The chapel in Naples went from being a shelter to one of seven LDS command centers in Florida, organizing relief efforts with Mormon Helping Hands volunteers. Thank you. Distributing food and supplies, along with equipment to help with the cleanup. There's no electricity in this neighborhood, and so a small generator was used to power a sound system in the chapel so President Irene could share a message of hope with the Mormon Helping Hands volunteers. Volunteers filled the chapel, enduring the heat and humidity as President Irene came to thank them for their service. The Lord knows you loves you and it's one thing for us to thank you but that's not the thank you that you need you need it from him i i pray for that now and right away mormon helping hands volunteers with their yellow t-shirts got to work joining others to bring relief to their community this morning we we were over at a catholic law school um, where there were numerous trees down there were cars with trees on top bye bye great to see you President Eyring visited a neighborhood where volunteers were hard at work. What I've seen is the, uh, the hand of the Lord in these people. Uh, happy, uh, determined, incredibly well organized. Latter-day Saints from other areas of the state. We're from Tampa, Florida, and we want to help tomorrow as well. Came to Naples to help, camping at night on the lawn of the chapel. It's a wonderful experience to uh, uh, you know, help those who uh, can't help themselves and to, uh, to show our, our love and support for them. And hundreds of miles northeast from Naples. People still haven't heard about the church and just seeing those yellow shirts just be covered throughout uh, Jacksonville is really wonderful. A similar volunteer effort is underway in Jacksonville. With vinegar, you don't have to leave the home. If right. you used a lot of that, you have to go outside and get some oxygen. Right. Jacqueline Natal serves as a local Relief Society president. Getting the word out about what we were doing, going around the neighborhood, passing out the flyers, the helping hands. It's been a really humbling experience in getting to know my community. Driving like a truck. Groups of volunteers fanned out into neighborhoods, looking for residents in need of some help. Gene Patch is the president of a young single adult branch. This is part of life in Florida, and uh, the church is very well organized uh, to help uh, provide this service. And uh, they give us all the things we need to, to do the work, and we just have to be or go out and do it. These volunteers offer to help on a street. It's kind of a thing we should be doing, and some Christ would be doing, so we should try to emulate that. Not far from the river, which surged during the storm. It's actually my second time to be able to do this. Last year I was living here in Jacksonville when Hurricane Matthew was here, and then you can just really see how much it really moves people and like the amount of gratitude in their heart. A wonderful band of uh, Mormon children came and cleaned the marsh grass out. Robin Evans says she couldn't be more grateful for the unexpected help. I've been trying to do this by myself because the heat, I've only been able to do a little bit in the morning and in the afternoon. And uh, it, look at this, they've taken care of this in about 30 minutes, it's wonderful. God brought them to me, I'm telling you, I know what happened. Kay Wheeler lost a few trees in the storm and several limbs and branches were cluttering her yard. I was gonna read my Bible. When they knocked my front door, I didn't hear them knocking. And all of a sudden, they all just came storming in here. And I said, good heavens. And so 
I, what God will put, put on you, He'll do for you. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. And it's the coming together as new friends that these volunteers find rewarding. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful way to meet people, too. They're very appreciative, and uh, we get to form some good friendships. We, it's, it's kind of special things. People watched in horror as fires spread throughout Northern California. Still ahead, how the kindness of strangers eases the pain for those who lost everything. The firestorm came, and it was from wall to wall, 30 feet high. It was coming fast. It was football field in 3.2 seconds. I looked at my phone, and, it, and we had a notification to evacuate immediately. All the grass was on fire. That house was on fire. This house was on fire already. There were many tornadoes inside of it, and it was throwing objects, not just little leaves and stuff, it was throwing objects this big over onto the houses. We got our kids and grabbed just a few things and left. Stop the pressure! October 9th, 2017, a day that's left its mark on this quiet community. <laughs> For Eric Anderson. Here's the keyboard to my, looks like the keyboard to my uh, laptop. It isn't easy coming back to this place a place he once called home, now almost unrecognizable. The big TV was over here, I lost that. Anderson's rental home is one of 3,000 structures destroyed in the Tubbs fire back in October. It's a day he says he'll never forget. It's just surreal that this actually happened. Still today, it's everything's gone. And although almost all of his belongings have been destroyed. Out here we had a, a 10 foot deck. 10 foot out, ran the full length of the, of the house. Anderson considers himself lucky. 44 residents died in one of the worst fires California's wine country has ever seen. In this hilly residential part of town, not much is left. Desolation, it's desolation. It's just everything was burned down. And just down the road. The fire came through this area, the Kofi Park neighborhood. And, and you can see, I mean, some work has been done, but Crews continue to clear some of these lots, either for families to rebuild their homes or to sell these properties so that they can move on and, and rebuild their lives. A family facing that very decision. It went into uh, a, a medium-sized living room. Veronica and Alan Daramon. And you just see this rubble, and it makes you grateful that you got out. It makes you grateful that there's so much more to life than what this is. What this was, was their forever home, gone within minutes. In the early morning hours of the fire, the couple was one of dozens of families who took shelter here at an LDS meeting house, sleeping in classrooms. They say it was in those first few nights they saw the true meaning of love in action. We just see these little families coming in with groceries to put into the kitchen and it was just really sweet. It was like just this grassroots effort that eventually evolved into this very organized effort. And it was, it was pretty brilliant to watch. For many of the families, it took days for them to be allowed back into their neighborhoods to see if somehow, miraculously, their homes survived. For some, it did. But for others, they weren't so lucky, which led them to their next question. What do we need now? For many, it was shelter, food and clothing, and the response from the community was overwhelming. Talk about an outpouring of service, outpouring of the Spirit, um, people just wanting to do what the Savior would do in the circumstances that we were facing. Gary Kitchen, the LDS stake president for the area, says the LDS church donated thousands of dollars worth of food and emergency supplies. He says although there was no shortage of selfless service in the days, weeks, and months following the fire, there are still unseen wounds that continue to heal. There's trauma. There's a lot of emotion, uh, emotional challenges that come along with a traumatic event like this. We've seen that in our members. Um, 
And so there's a healing process associated with that as well. And that takes time. For the Wade family, aid in the form of care boxes has been their key to recovery. 150 pounds. Oh. Probably. I got it, yeah. To feel the authentic love that we felt from so many from different you know, times in our lives reach out to us um, was a, just a really meaningful lesson for us. Letters from complete strangers came pouring in to their new rental home. So this one says, Thursday, November 3rd, dear friend, I'm writing to, to remind you that no matter what has happened in your life, you are loved and thought of at every turn. Words the young family now live by as they try to help their children process the traumatic event. The little boy's mother peered at the young mongoose. Perhaps he isn't dead at all, she said. Something they believe they wouldn't be able to do without the assistance of others. It's been incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, just a huge reminder that people in relationships matter and um, just that we're here to help each other um, through, through hard things. This is the entry here. So many people have this uh, willingness and desire to you know, comfort people who have, uh, have had tragedy. After losing their home, Carolyn and Larry Stratford say their lives have changed, surprisingly, for the better. It's heartwarming to see the kindness and willingness. The people want to give, they want to help. Help the couple desperately needs after losing everything. Their dream home flattened by the flames. Among the rubble, a family heirloom, a piano passed down by Carolyn's father. It's a feeling of loss. Uh, we liked our stuff. Um, but in the perspective, looking back, the things that keep going are what will always exist. And what she says will continue to exist, her love of music, something even a raging fire can't destroy. Much like the lessons of love and kindness, she and her husband have learned from those who continue to serve them as they, like so many others, try to rebuild. It's going to be like it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to take time. We visit the Bishop Central Storehouse in Salt Lake City where emergency supplies are shipped to regional facilities throughout the United States. Five days after the Eye of Irma hit Naples, Florida, Another truck of supplies has reached the local chapel. Unlike other deliveries here that came from the church's regional bishop storehouses in Indianapolis and Atlanta, because of the magnitude of this disaster. We just drove straight down here, so it took us two and a half days. This 53-foot truck loaded with 40,000 pounds of food, equipment, and supplies came directly from the bishop's central storehouse in Salt Lake City. It was a long drive down here, but it was overwhelming when we saw some of the devastation, when we saw houses halfway underwater. Chad England, along with his dad and brother, volunteered to help deliver the shipment to Florida, supplies that are sorely needed, including 25 chainsaws. It's overwhelming to see what Mother Nature has done, and, but what, what's awesome to see is how everybody's rallying together, and, and uh, it, it's great to see how many people are helping to, for a good cause. When a disaster hits, church leaders will notify the Bishop's Central Storehouse, and they will begin organizing needed food and supplies that will be distributed to help those who are suffering. Well, our mission is really, as the Savior put it, you know, to help the poor and the needy. With shelves holding food and commodities, typically meant to help the needy, fill the half million square feet of the Bishop's Central Storehouse in Salt Lake City. The food is then distributed to 115 local Bishop storehouses in the U.S. and Canada, along with other locations internationally. And most of this, these are emergency items here. 
But in addition to providing for the needs of the less fortunate, the storehouse also keeps items to help with humanitarian efforts following a disaster. Unique items that are generally in short supply. Tarps, shovels, hammers, even small generators. With Irma and Harvey hitting about the same time, it was uh, kind of like uh, the phones were ringing 24 hours a day. We need this, we need that. With the immense need following the two hurricanes in September, the Bishop Central Storehouse not only replenished regional distribution centers, but sent some items directly to where it was needed. I quit counting after 160 trucks went out of here and they were going to Florida and going to Texas and all places in between, whatever we needed to do to make sure that we were fulfilling the needs of those local uh, members as well as non-members. When it comes to a disaster, we're helping everyone. While most people will not be severely impacted by a disaster, the church teaches by example a principle that is espoused, self-reliance. We would hope that every family is prepared in case of some kind of an emergency, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a flood or an earthquake. It could be unemployment. It could be a variety of things, sickness or whatever, and we would hope that they have enough uh, in their storage to be able to prepare themselves to uh, last a few months or whatever it happens to be. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who live in virtually every country of the world care deeply about the human family. The Church will continue to contribute resources and manpower to provide aid in areas of need and in times of turmoil. In his first public message after becoming the 17th president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Russell M. Nelson spoke directly about the church's ongoing efforts to provide humanitarian relief around the world. Our hearts go out to the victims of natural disasters like we've had in Mexico, an earthquake, and, and in other parts of the world, the hurricanes and tornadoes and floods. So what prompts people to heed the call to help following these disasters. Well, I had a feeling that the Lord would want us to do that. He'd do it. He always went out to minister to the individuals. This church operation has a power to move people in times of disaster that I think is from, it just comes from the Lord. As he toured areas in the Caribbean and Florida damaged by the storms, President Henry B. Eyring was personally moved by the relief efforts he saw there. I would just say this, the scriptures say that you, you, you cannot, cannot be saved unless you care for the poor and the unfortunate. And uh, I think people do it not because they're told they have to. It just comes up. The, the pure love of Christ is in people who are truly converted. And so that shows. And to me, uh, all that goodness by the Latter-day Saints is not because they're Latter-day Saints, but because they're converted Latter-day Saints. Whether that service comes from volunteering or donating to the Church Humanitarian Fund, church leaders say the desire of members to serve their fellow man is why these yellow t-shirts have become a common sight in the aftermath of emergencies as they lend a hand to those in need. One of the, the most reassuring things is to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is really working in the lives of Latter-day Saints.